We are back. We're talking today about other treatments and a look at more specifically why those treatments, because they don't specialize in the metaphobia, and there isn't really many options out there, as I'm sure if you're listening into this, you've tried other versions, other things to help you move past your metaphobia to overcome it. So we're sort of diving into that topic a bit today, having a light discussion about it. So are you ready, Rob? Yeah, mate. Go. Shoot. Fantastic. Okay. Cool. Uh, just talking a bit about my own experience, I think, keeping it relatable to people listening in that have a metaphobia. I myself struggled with metaphobia for a long time. And when I was having a really difficult time with things, I'm pretty sure I saw just about every form of help under the sun. You know, all branches of psychology, all branches of help when it comes to mental health. And yet I wasn't really making much progress with my emetophobia. Now, I imagine going off of the research that we've looked at and also just speaking to clients on a daily basis that have struggled with emetophobia for many years, that a lot of people can relate to my experience. Now, why do you think, Rob, that that's the case? You know. Why do you think that a lot of people have tried pretty much everything in order to help themselves overcome emetophobia, and yet it's not until they come and have a look at the Thrive Program and our emetophobia-specific channel that they are so stumped in terms of their progress? Okay, <clears throat> another big question. All right, so first of all, they, they, they always sound, when you say, I've got, I've got a couple of questions for you for a podcast, they think, well, that sounds easy. And then you ask a biggie. So this, this, this is possibly the most important thing we're ever going to discuss. Okay. The most important no, no topic for a podcast for, for a couple of reasons. Okay. First of all, why, why are most other treatments unsuccessful? If I start with saying why Thrive Program is completely successful. Okay, so what we did with the Thrive Program for Emetophobia, it is a program that was specifically created and aimed at both the symptoms that an emetophobe has, the thinking styles that an emetophobe has, the belief systems that an emetophobe has, the behaviours and the habits that an emetophobe has. So, so it's created specifically to match every single one of their traits, their thoughts, their beliefs. You know, because you've been for the program, that the backbone of the program is, is what we call a TQ quiz, a Thrive Quotient quiz. And in that quiz, we ask um, about 110 questions before and after. And those 110 questions are mostly focused on the beliefs that an emetophobia sufferer has, the eight or ten different thinking styles that every one of them has, like catastrophizing, brooding, uh, learned helplessness, um, social anxiety, black and white thinking, hypervigilance, perfectionism. Emetophobes have all of those thinking styles to, to a great degree. Okay, And any one of those thinking styles could scupper their progress in any other treatment. Okay. So if I'm yep. still, if I, if I don't overcome my hypervigilance about my metaphobia, there's no way I can get over it. doesn't matter what the other treatment, whether it's long-term psychotherapy, whether it's hypnotherapy, whether it's CBT, whether it's some kind of graded exposure therapy, it will not work while I've still got my um, hypervigilance about metaphobia. Okay. Equally, yep. Yep. they will not work while I'm still obsessing about uh, uh, cleanliness, hygiene, dirt, germs, and anything else that I think might make me sick. I will also not... So it's you know, our specific understanding of that hypervigilance and how it specifically relates to a metaphobia that not a lot of other specialists have that allows us to, you know, tailor that progress and make it so well, consistent. Well, there are, there are no other specialists in this area mm -hmm. in terms of programs. Yeah. And no, none of the other programs or therapies address that. Even, even 
high level CBT doesn't address. I think the best version I've seen addresses perhaps 20 or 25% of the thinking styles and beliefs that you would have as an emetophobe. So, so the next best, and when I say best, the next most successful treatment after our program for emetophobia is probably about 25% successful. Yes, occasionally someone will... will, will you know, get a grips on their metaphobia. There might even be people that have overcome it um, uh, with some other treatment, right? But they will be one in a hundred or one in a thousand, and it won't be predictable. It won't be understandable, okay? In our program, we know everything that you did, Joe, to create Mm. your emetophobia, everything you thought, everything you did, every behavior, every safety-seeking behavior, every worry, every doubt, every dream, every nightmare, everything you ever thought, dreamt, felt, imagined about emetophobia in order to create emetophobia, we knew. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and just on, on that one, sorry, I'll let you digress from there. It just got me thinking of a session that I just had first right. session with a brand new client and this and, and they were sitting there smiling away and they wanted to clarify that they weren't smiling at me because they you know weren't enjoying what I was saying they were smiling because they'd never heard someone say so clearly what was going on inside of their head before and I think that relates so specifically to what you were just saying that we do know exactly how an emetophobia I mean, and when you have a emetophobia it can feel so lonely and isolated like it's only you experiencing this and when someone else gets it and really gets it really understands how you're feeling it's such a liberating weight off your chest kind of thing that you can't help but smile and laugh about it yeah the the, the best video testimony we've got and i've forgotten the lady's name it's an american lady and it's a video she's doing from her car it, 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 on her phone in her car, not driving, she was stationary, by the way. And she was just saying, I knew the moment I found the program that it was going to work. And that's because she could see that we, we completely understood how. It's like if, if you've gone on a journey from, from Scotland to, to Land's End, we've mapped out exactly how you, we've know, we know every turn you took in order to get there, right? Every turn, every every road, every highway, every roundabout, every underpass, we've mapped it out completely. It's so predictable, it's so understandable, we've mapped it out. So when you want to get back from Land's End back up to Scotland again, it's easy, right? Because we've mapped out your route. We know how you got there, we know how you created the problem, and we know exactly how you need to uncreate it. And that's why we always talk about it being so predictable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So back to where I was. Um, so you you will only overcome emetophobia if you address all of the component parts or as many of those component parts as possible. There are lots of components that create emetophobia that make up. It's about 26, in fact, isn't there? We used to talk about Lego bricks. There are, there are 26 Lego bricks that build this wall, 26 components to your emetophobia, 26 ingredients to this cake that we've made, okay? Only when you address yep. all 26 of them will you overcome your phobia, okay? And that's, in essence, mm. the answer to your question. No other program yep. or intervention anywhere addresses any more than four or five of those ingredients those those parts okay we address all of them you're not left with any part of that phobia in existence once you've overcome it okay so that's why that's why ours works and that's why it's so predictable and even if someone struggles with it because of course people do struggle with it right not everyone gets through this in the six to eight weeks some people take months okay but it's always because there's one of the components they haven't quite overcome yet it's so so clear it's never ever it's never ever been 
something that wasn't in our program. Yeah. Okay? If someone struggled to overcome it, even with our program, and then eventually they get there, it's never, ever been something that wasn't in there. It was always an ingredient that was in the program that they hadn't quite mastered yet. And all we needed to do was find out what that part was and then uh, set out some kind of challenge or some exercise to overcome that. So that's why 95% of the time, any other treatments are just not going to work. If they do, it's sheer luck. Mm. And of course, there's the occasional mm. fluke. Uh, um, but in terms of the predictability and knowing that, you know, th you know you've, you've got lost on your journey, this map will lead you back to, you know, where you start from. This will undo your metaphobia. That's why this is so predictable, so, so predictable. So any other intervention is only going to help at best a little bit. And you might say, well, you know, what's the harm in that? I had a conversation with a mother this week, kind of along those lines. She's saying, well, look, Rob, I want to do the Thrive program. But actually, the, the conversation was actually we've been offered some free CBT through the NHS. And we're going to go down that route first of all and i said i can i can give you several reasons why that's not a good idea the mm. main reason why that's not a good idea is that chances are it's not going to work i mean it's very very likely it's not going to work at best very very yep. best the sufferers might learn to cope with it a little bit more at very very best if they're, if they're very fortunate yep. and they get a very skilled cbt coach they might learn a little bit okay but what is going to happen is this the sufferer is going to get their hopes up because mum's going to say, we found this person, we've got a referral, they're a professional, blah, blah, blah. Right. They're going to help you. The sufferer is going to get their hopes up, right? And then they're going to feel massively deflated and powerless when it doesn't. and helpless yep. when it doesn't, okay? And then when they come to us in three months, six months, two years' time, they're in a much worse position than they actually are if they just did it now. It's and always, there's a always, massive belief that comes with that. Absolutely. Of, is this actually going to work? This, you know, what, what are the chances? So then there's a huge barrier to learning and application. And, and, and then even if they do find us and they do come to us or they're referred to us, once they have absolutely no belief at all left that they can be helped, they're going to put so little effort in that they that, 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 that they can, they're just going to struggle to get there. They, they need to understand that the program will work and put loads of effort in. So if you, th if you think that, if I asked you, what do you think the biggest belief is that emetophobes have? What's the biggest belief they have? Being sick would be the worst thing in the world or seeing someone else being sick would be the worst thing in the world. I couldn't cope. Okay. What's their biggest belief about their possibility or ability to get over it there's no way that i could overcome it it's been with me for too long it's part of my life i tried i failed no chance okay so the metaphor's biggest belief in that respect is i'll never get over <laughs> this yeah i'll never get over this yeah it's yeah, too big i'm powerless i've tried everything like you okay every time you tried another treatment Okay, and you yep. got excited, you heard about this, you found out about that, you did a Google search, you found out about something else, you built up a little bit of hope. Some of those things may have helped you a little bit, a little bit up and down, okay? But each time, effectively, your overall sense of hope or your overall belief that there'll ever be a cure for you got less and less mm. and less. And the amount of effort anyone puts into achieving anything in life is directly proportionate to how much they believe it's going to work or help, right? So yep. you're much, much better off starting our program before you've even tried anything else because, A, our program's much more likely to be successful than anything else, and, B, you're going to go at it without the belief that, well, I've tried everything else and they didn't work. Why would this work? And that's massively yep. Yep. important. And it's massively important because, and we've seen this hundreds of times, someone might take four or five years or longer from trying one thing and then coming to us. They feel so helpless, so hopeless, 
that they just struggle on with their life for another three or four years before they come back. And that's four years of their life extra they'd have had if they'd have just come to us first. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's why, you know, if I ask you again, it's a bit of a leading question because you know the answer, right? What is the most common thing that emetophobes say to us once they've been through the program? They're over it. They say... I wish I could have done it sooner. I wish I'd have done it sooner. I wish I'd have come to you early. I wish when I first heard about it, I wish when someone first said something about it, um, I'd have come to you then. And you and I know, Joe, that we are doing everything we can to try and make it easier for people to get to us sooner and quicker. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. That phrase is something that I hear genuinely almost on a daily basis, yeah. especially when a client starts making a little bit of progress, right? A little bit of evidence to suggest that maybe they can overcome their phobia. The first thing that comes out of their mouth is, why didn't I have this program 10 years ago? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think even when I was a psychotherapist, I don't think I've ever worked with any other symptom where sufferers feel so powerless when they have it. Mm. You know, I, I, as you know, I'm yep. seeing a couple of people at the moment, I'm helping them, they've got cancer. I, I don't think it would be unfair to say, no, I don't think it is unfair to say, I think they would happily, and I'll check afterwards, right? The two people, the two friends I know that got cancer that I'm helping them with, right? They feel more powerful about overcoming cancer the most emetophobes mm. feel about overcoming emetophobia. And that makes sense, perfect sense. You know? Anyone that's not got yeah. emetophobia uh, yeah, I... will say that's that's nonsense. How can you say it? But you, you get that, right? So if yeah. they Yeah, yeah, and, and most emetophobes are listening and will. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so when you when you already feel that powerless about a symptom, about something that's ruining your life, I mean ruining your life, it's such a delicate belief system that you don't want to just keep trying loads of different things, hoping that, that one will help. And that's fine if all you're trying to do is find a better way of running a marathon or, or improving your football skills, right, or improving your golf swing. Mm. That's fine. You can try 10 different techniques because your belief isn't bottoming out every time something doesn't work. If you've got a metaphobia, it does, because yeah. each time is, is, yeah. is feels like your last hope. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So it's really, really important that people understand that as soon as soon as they can they should come to our program and if they ever have the option of doing this or something else come here first because you cannot yep. be made worse by our program there's nothing in it that's going to make you worse in any way shape or form and even if you only started it or studied the first chapter or had the first session with one of our coaches you are still going to be 20% better than you were before doing it, right? You're only going to get better. But the other, yep. the other interventions do not work because A, they are not specifically, ours isn't specifically focused on emetophobia. Ours was created specifically for emetophobia. We didn't have a program mm. that we tried to shoehorn into it. We, we looked at everything that an emetophobe does and we created their emetophobia program based on that. So it's created specifically for you as an emetophobe. And that's why it makes so much sense. And that's why it's so much more successful than anything else. Because it gets all of the different components. Every one of the components that that created your emetophobia and is driving your emetophobia, maintaining your emetophobia... Every one of those components is catered for within our program. That's why ours works yep. and really nothing else does at the moment. I hope I'm not yep. being too yep. clear about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it it's coming, this, this whole podcast is coming from a point of, I, I mean, speaking for myself, frustration and the frustration on my end isn't at the 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 program or a method it, it's i know how much better my life is without a metaphobia and i'm sure that anyone that has a metaphobia can imagine what it's like and i don't want that to come from a point of well listen i'm dangling this in front of you you can't get it yeah. because you can get it 
you just have to be willing to to give it a go. And that's why I'm so passionate about doing this, about working with metaphobia sufferers, about allowing them to overcome it, because it really is possible. It really is doable. And your life is significantly better when you are over it. You just have to be willing to give it a go. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Cool. Fantastic. Anything more to add on that? I think that really sums up. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't nicely. I don't think so. I, I think. I think that. Um, I think. I think if if these other uh, um, interventions and therapists and CBT and psychologists and you know, you and I were speaking before the podcast about about. Uh, Fiona, the mum that I spoke to this week, the mum of a young emetophobe, you know, she went to see a clinical psychologist a couple of weeks back for her daughter with emetophobia. And the clinical psychologist sat there and told her it can't be cured. I mean, why would you, why would you say that? Why would you say it to someone? How, how unbelievably ridiculous a thing to say, you know, within, within earshot of, of, of a young emetophobe. You know, apart from being untrue, it's just, it's just uh, the worst thing in the world to say. But but she also said that that the clinical psychologist and the professional sure just didn't understand emetophobia at all. It was only when she found our program that she realised that there is someone out there or something out there that does understand it. And I, I think yeah. that's the that's uh, the biggest difference. I think that's why. The other procedures, the other programs, the other interventions just don't work. They just don't understand it to the depth that we do. There you go. In a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Good. Th thank you. That was Good an easy discussion. One. That was a quick one. Thank you for everyone that's been listening in as well. Um, I hope that's been enlightening. And if you're sitting here really affronted because you've gone through some other help, my question is, if you have gotten better through exposure therapy, through any other forms of help, are you completely over your emetophobia? If you are completely over it, fantastic, obviously fantastic. We would love to hear from you. Yeah. I'd love to hear how you overcame your emetophobia. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but it seems unlikely from all of the research and experience that we have on it that you are completely over your emetophobia without looking at all of this and putting it into action. We've got a little jump cut here for you keen viewers that might have noticed a bit of a scenery change between me and Rob. Yesterday we recorded the podcast, which you would have just listened all the way through, but we had a bit of a chat and we felt like we missed out a really, really important question that we wanted to dive into a little bit. So without any further ado, Rob, I just wanted to talk about specifically with you. There's a lot of leading psychologists such as David Veal, on emetophobia that don't believe that you can truly overcome emetophobia, right? Why do you think that that is? Okay, that, that, I mean, that's a good question. Why do you think that is? I mean, we know why that is because they haven't got a program that helps people overcome it. And it's as simple as that. Hardly worth turning all the machinery on just for me to say that one answer, right? But it's, that, that's essentially yeah. it. They, they do not have a program that reliably or even partially helps, supports, encourages people to overcome emetophobia, okay? Therefore, they have to say emetophobia can't be cured. I made a reference yesterday, didn't I, to the mother I spoke to last week, Fiona, who spoke to another psychologist who said that it's impossible to overcome emetophobia. But what they mean is it, and it's such a terrible thing to say to a sufferer, which is so why it's so important we address it now. What they mean is, we can't help you to overcome emetophobia. Okay? And I just wish they would say that. Yeah? If, so, if someone came to me and said, Rob, could you uh, um, help me swim the channel? I wouldn't say, nobody can swim the channel. I would say, Sorry, I haven't got the skills to teach how to swim the channel. I wouldn't say nobody can do that. Yeah. So I, th I think 
going on from what we said in the earlier in the earlier part of the podcast, where our our program completely matches all of the symptoms, all of the thinking styles, all of the beliefs, all of the behaviours that an emetophobe has that created their phobia in the first place. That's why our program is so successful in helping them to undo, to unpick that knot and undo all of those thoughts, feelings, actions, behaviours that caused it in the first place. No other program has that. CBT therapists don't have that. David Veal doesn't have that. That's why their program doesn't work. And that's why they say you can't be cured. What they mean is we can't cure you. That's it. And just to feel like I should do my duties on this side as well, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, do you think that possibly the reason why they might be saying that is part of the fact that they don't have as much evidence to back it up? So we see on a weekly basis clients completely overcoming their metaphobia, yeah. right? We have clear evidence that what we do works, right? Clear yeah. as day. Now, do you think because they don't have the skill set or the research or the understanding, so they're not getting the results, so that buys into their biases uh, and their beliefs that, that it can't be that's, in, that's entirely why they say that, 100%. Yeah, they haven't got a program that reliably or even partially reliably cures emetophobia that's yeah. it simple as that uh, and and all their evidence and all of their feedback you know we, we've seen hundreds of people uh, um that have overcome their metaphobia with us that were told by david veal and other such people that it's impossible to overcome their metaphobia i mean it's bonkers you'd never say it i mean yeah. with the best will in the world right let's say that you're not just uh, you're not a, a uk a psychologist okay let's say you are the surgeon general of america right you are you are the top doctor in the english-speaking world okay you still wouldn't say there's no cure right surely mm -hmm. the very the very mm -hmm. most you would say is well we don't have a reliable cure there seems to be some other things out there that might help but we don't have one you wouldn't just say no yeah. Would you? Yeah. What a ridiculous, yeah. horrible, indefensible thing to say to somebody. And if they knew, if they knew how powerless and how um, badly affected some emetophobes were, they would never say that to them because it's like signing a death warrant for them. Yeah, it's cut cutting all hope or yeah taking away all the power from the sufferer before they've even given it a go yeah and you and i know because we discussed it earlier and i've just got off the phone from discussing it with another mum that the biggest problem with emetophobes and parents of emetophobes is because of what they're told by other people they don't believe there's a resolution they don't believe it's a cure they don't believe there's a way of someone completely overcoming it and so they don't put any effort in to do that and that's terrible yeah. that's it yeah yeah. Yeah. Hence why we felt like we had to add on this a little bit and address it. Brilliant. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you for listening, everyone. More to come. Cheers, Rob. See you, Joe. Take it easy. Bye-bye, mate.